Hi, everyone, and welcome to another Facebook Live. I'm Jeff Palmore, a.k.a. Silk Guru, uh, bringing you some great uh, information about uh, health, nutrition, some of the uh, breakthrough research that's out there, and, of course, a uh, how to do so in a healthy, fit, oriented way through a plant-based diet and nutrition. So thanks for joining me once again. And this episode is going to be about training. So I know for um, some of you, you may be heading back to the gym after a break, obviously, from the pandemic. Um, some of you are still waiting it out. Some of you have home gyms. Some of you are working out in the park. Some of you are working out uh, with bands and um, other different items like this. That's all awesome. That, but uh, for my intents and purposes, um, for getting the best shape I know I can be, there is nothing that beats uh, free weights for me. And that's a personal taste. I'm not uh, saying anything for your personal preferences. Whatever works for you is awesome. But I'm going to be talking about some techniques for resistance training that can be applied to bands, be applied to home workouts, can be applied to lots of different uh, ways of training. Um, and, and it's specifically getting out of the routine. So what do I mean by that? Well, one, I don't mean routine like you shouldn't train as regularly. Uh, that's definitely one of my three big tenets, which is uh, train with consistency, train with intensity, and then train with nutrient density. You got to put, you got to be consistent because sending that message to your muscles, telling them over and over and over again, we need you for this, we need you for this, we need you for this. That's when the actual tissues, the cells themselves, start retaining that memory, often called muscle memory. And so, uh, I want to talk about that just for a second before we jump into this. Um, muscle memory is a real thing. Our body, through our DNA, through our tissues themselves, through the, the, the cell wall, through heat shock proteins, through all these different cell structures, stores information, captures information. That's how our immune system can work. Our body can uh, find a, a pathogen that comes in, a virus, a bacteria, or a, a parasite, attack it, learn how to kill it, and then basically store that information. So next time that that pathogen enters the body, our body is ready and knows exactly how to kill that pathogen. Well, your muscle does the same thing. And if you're if you're just like working out every once in a while, your, your body says, okay, I only need it every once in a while. So I'm not going to build up a whole set. I'm not going to hard program this. It's like storing it in memory. So what you want to do is that consistency, that part stay in routine. What I'm talking about is the routine that people get into, which is doing the same workouts, the three sets of 10 and, and not getting the same results. So you get a results to a point and what you get to is called a plateau where you don't make any more progress. And I know it's so frustrating for people because I see guys in the gym all the time doing the exact same workouts, the same exercises, chest and tries, back and buys, doing the same sets, not three sets, not adding any weight, not changing the, the rep ranges, not changing the set ranges, not changing the angles, the motions, not changing at all. Well, the body says, okay, we're good. We adapted to that, what you're doing. We don't need to change anymore. So there are the original way to create change is called overload. You basically overload the body and the body has to adapt or respond by either adding more muscle cells or strengthening the size of the cell. So there are two ways you can add strength and muscle. And one is a little more volumizing and one is a little more strengthening. Um, so one's called hyperplasia. Hyperplasia is the actual recruitment of more cells. These little nascent cells or progenitor cells, these are baby cells that are just sitting around our body waiting until there's a need. And then when our muscle is stressed, it sends those cells over there, so progenitor cells, and, and then they become either muscle or bone. And this is how we recruit new cells. 
Now, those new cells need time to adapt and, and grow into full uh, mature muscle. And that's another term that's uh, used in, the, in workouts is mature muscle. That means if you've been training that muscle over and over, the body has been recruiting new cells and then maintains that amount of muscle so that you can handle that stress or that load of weight. So the second way to uh, approach that is, is called hypertrophy. Now, hypertrophy gets the actual single muscle cell itself, or tissue or fiber in this case, to actually expand or grow, volumize. Hypertrophy it makes the cell bigger, whereas uh, hyperplasia actually recruits more cells. So ideally, you want to combine both hypertrophy and hyperplasia type training, some to recruit new cells so you have more cells, and then hypertrophy training to make those cells even bigger. That's where you can maximize your muscle growth. But you need to change up your training because some types of training are more hypertrophy and some are more hyperplasia. So the typical way to get hyper hyperplasia training is is through adding more weight now this is not really the 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 only way that this can be done and uh, adding more and more weight has its limits eventually the body will break <laughs> break down because it can't handle the weight or, or the body will actually uh, find a limit that like that's as much that's as far as you can go um, and of course, I'm speaking without drugs. Without dr with drugs, you can push the body even farther. And I do not suggest drugs. Please believe me. I'm about health and fitness, not about drug use. That's why. That's why we go by clean machine. Uh, I'm encouraging people to keep this amazing machine clean. Um, so now you've got these two forms of, of training that need to be done. One's a little bit more focused on strength, but strength doesn't always require just simply adding more weight. So look, I'm 58 years old. If I was adding weight the whole time I've been training, I've been training for almost 40 years. Are you kidding me? If I was adding more weight all the time, my joints would be trashed. Um, Ronnie Coleman, right? you know, I worked at BSN uh, way back in the day when Ronnie Coleman, the probably the most prolific bodybuilder ever, uh, was doing amazing things with with weights, doing uh, leg presses at near 2,000 pounds, doing lunges with five to 800 pounds on his back. I mean, it's just insane weights, obviously um, not natural, uh, but all that weight put amazing pressure on his joints and he had both of his hips replaced because of it. So I, I want to tell you, look, I'm 58, no joint issues, no, none of that issues, yet I can still maintain that size even at my age because I'm changing up the styles of my workouts. So I'm going to give you some, let's dive into some of the tips and tricks for, um, for achieving that without having to add weight. And of course, women don't want to use the keep continuing to, to add weight, but you do want to increase that tone, that look of uh, musculature, maybe that, that, that fit body look, that's, that's an incredible thing, but you have to keep pushing yourself and you can't keep pushing the muscle to adapt if you're not asking it to do something different. The body adapts to whatever it is you're doing. And once it has adapted to that, saying, I can do that really well, it stops adapting. So the trick to get around that is to keep changing the workout. So the body, the muscle has to keep changing or adapting to the new type of exercise that you work. So let's jump into that. Uh, first, always practice safe sets. <laughs> That's a little funny, little, little inside joke. Uh, safe sets of workouts. Um, always don't go heavy on in your initial sets. Start with a warm up, lighter sets, or or even cardio to get the body and blood flowing, so that there's blood in the tissues. The body is warmed up, and you're gonna have less risk for injury. Use the right weight or resistance when you're starting out, and build up gradually through your workouts. That way, it'll give your body a time to pull even more muscle, pull, recruit hormones, recruit new cells, all that. Get nutrition into the cells, use up that glycogen, all of those things. And remember, tendons strengthen slower than muscle. So your muscle may actually get stronger as you're lifting weights, and you think, oh, I can add more weight, I can add more weight, and then pop, there goes the tendon, because you haven't given the tendon time enough to adapt to that weight. Muscle adapts a lot faster to weight increases than tendons do. 
remember that and be smart about adding your weight so that you don't keep adding the weight that is more than your tendon do because that's where a lot of the injury happens once you pop that tendon for some people you're never the same again but it can put you out of workouts for months even up to a year to to properly heal and possibly even surgery to repair that so you don't want to go there just don't let your ego don't lift with your ego lift with your body and understand the physiology of your body allow more time i know it feels good to add that more weight you want to keep adding more because you want to do that stress i'm going to show you some techniques where you don't have to keep adding weight but you can still make gains and not only that strengthen those tendons even better plus all the smaller supporting muscle groups that are there supporting the major muscle groups. So what I see is people training a certain muscle group a certain way. So what they do is they overstrengthen that one type of muscle, right? All these small supporting muscles that help it in different micro movements are not being strengthened because you're just strengthening the large muscle group what that happens is you can add more and more weight stronger 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 but you haven't strengthened the supporting muscles around it and then when you lift something a little odd or a little out of balance or a little in bad form boom those muscles tweak twinge pull tear you don't want that so th using these techniques that i'm going to tell you will actually help strengthen all those smaller and supporting muscle groups so that you strengthen the whole muscle areas and allows you to uh, reduce the risk of injury, strengthen and be stronger than you would just doing uh, isolate uh, uh, types of trainings. Um, so another thing is use a trainer or spotter definitely um, when you're doing these, because a lot of these are going to be new techniques for, uh, for some of you, uh, for, for the for the people out there who are already into heavy training, you're probably gonna be familiar with a lot of these, but hey, you may learn something. Look, I've, I've been working out for over 40 years. I'm, I'm still learning new, cool new techniques that I like to uh, impl in, in, uh, include into my workout routines. Um, so if you wanna use a trainer, you should check out our, um, our site. Uh, definitely, um, let me uh, go ahead and put it up there. Um, this is we have uh trainers you can go to cleanmachineonline.com um and our ambassadors there we have great ambassadors um for bodybuilding corinne sutton he's a three times pro he's a nutritionist a master trainer amazing if you're looking to compete and be on the serious side corinne's the best in the business uh longer term vegan too as well for physique athletes out there if you're interested in that monk uh aka joe coleman three-time pro is about to compete again he gets in phenomenal shape so if you're looking to get that more of that beach body uh, he can hook you up with that too um yoga and fitness if that's your thing ella meggers is amazing she works yoga from the inside out so that your fitness comes with true empowerment comes with true lifestyle check out our website and then of course if you're into endurance like biking or swimming or running or jogging or triathlons um, we have two athletes john joseph 11 times 12 times shoot i don't even over 10 times uh triathlon uh, iron man triathlon uh competitor and uh brendan walsh who owns a world record in biking cross country so um you've got access to those athletes but let's talk uh more about getting to those workouts um so for some of you coming out of uh the workouts um and just getting back into the gym um and you've got your pandemic pooch <laughs> that little extra uh calories your your carburetor right for all the carbs you ate <laughs> you know? um, just think of them as stored future muscle food that's all it is all right so you gained a little body fat from uh not exercising as much as possible let's get back into the gym at in turn uh utilize that fat stores to feed the muscle. This is a great opportunity to actually get more gains. Your body's well rested. You've got an extra storage of useful energy that you can now use to really bring up your um, uh, 
type of training. So this training is called adaptive training. So what is muscle gains? Muscle gains are the muscle adapting to stress. You put a stress on the muscle and the muscle has to adapt by adding more muscle, either in muscle cell count, which is hyperplasia, or muscle volume size, right? Stronger, bigger muscle uh, cells, that's hypertrophy. Um, so you want both the strength and the size overall to keep a healthy fit and natural um, uh, muscle tissue. So how do we get there? So um, let's do that. First, we're gonna talk reps. So there's so many ways you can change up your workout. And I'm gonna just mention some of them, some of my favorites to just get you started. So you can change your rep range, your reps. Uh, one repetition is one lifting of the weight. So one rep, that's one rep. So how many reps do you do in a set? So reps is the rep, sets is how many times you do that before you move on to a next exercise. So rep range can be three or four reps for heavier weights, uh, six to eight reps for medium weights, 10 to 12 reps if you're looking for really combining a little bit of uh, type one and type two muscle fibers. And then there's rep volume. So you can increase the rep volume. So you can do up to 20 uh, reps in a single uh, exercise. Um, now there are different things that's going to do. It's gonna activate a little bit more type one muscle fiber, which is an endurance muscle fiber. It's a muscle fiber that doesn't really grow in size too much, but it increases your endurance, your ability to handle weights for a longer time. So increasing your endurance can be actually very helpful, even for strength and hypertrophy training. And that's because when you increase your endurance by using cardio or using a high rep range, like 20, 25, even 30 reps, I was doing leg reps, right? at 50 reps per set. <laughs> I know that sounds insane. The burn was fierce, was incredible, almost intolerable. Um, and I had to take a few breather uh, breather reps in between some of the sets because the, uh, the lactic acid burn was just so intense. But it's a great way to maximally stimulate without having to add so much weight. That amount of rep volume just really stresses the muscle and says, we really need more muscle tissue over here to be able to handle that volume of reps. Um, so another thing is rep speed, how fast you lift that weight. So there are a couple of different things in there. So one of my favorite techniques, and I want you guys to try this, <laughs> try it out at a sub about 50% of your normal weight. Take one of your sets, like let's say bicep curls, and do it super slow. So a super slow is a three to five second count rate. So one, two, three, four, and then back down. So super slows, super slows give you stress that you're holding the muscle. Now, normally when you do a, a set, a lot of people use momentum. Momentum means you're pushing really hard in the very beginning of the set, and then momentum is actually carrying the weight up. So you're not actually using the muscle, momentum is actually pulling that weight up by itself. You started with a force, so that's great. You're increasing force strength in the very beginning of the rep, but you're not getting much engagement in the muscle in the finish of the rep. So what a super slow does is engages your muscle the whole way because your muscle is at full tension, full engagement through the entire motion of the rep. Now, if you want to change that up a little bit, like doing a, a, a rep, a, a bicep rep, is, is change. Um, so start doing one of your sets with a, a vertical position so that it's hard, hard, hard. And then it gets a little easier at this because, because gravity is taking over. So what you can do is just simply lean forward. Now your arm is vertical to the ground and it's actually hardest at the very top. This way you're stressing the body, the muscle at maximum contraction instead of just stressing it at the, at the uh, first two thirds of the rep and then allowing the easy part to fall forward just because of gravity. So this is another way you can do it is by changing the position of the rep. 
So I do spider curls uh, and I do standing curls and then I do pulley curls. So all of these are engaging the muscle in a, in a different way. So standing curls are your typical ones where you're getting more stress at about uh, the one third lift and the two third lift and not as much on the uh, last third of the motion. In a spider curl, you um, face backwards on an incline, right? You face forwards on an incline. So you're facing down there and then hold it up and then actually right at the top, at the top of the squeeze of the muscle, when your muscle is in full engagement at the top, that's when it's hardest because gravity is pulling straight down from that point. So it's the hardest at the very top. So you can get a real strong con uh, contraction right there, send a lot of muscle stimulation signaling to the muscle and get the body to do that. So changing the position at which you're doing, you can change the position to across the body that engages it differently. You can do it outside the body that's engaging the muscle on a different angle. So there's lots of ways, changing the angle, changing the ways, using cables to do a straight curl towards you, that's a different angle. So there's lots of different ways you can stress this. You can change your hands. A reverse grip, when you reverse grip using an easy curl bar, you are, are changing the direction of the muscle. Look at the way that muscle changes. See how it changes? When you change your position of your hand, and you are contracting it in a different way. So all of these different subtle techniques, if you keep changing them in your workouts, now how often should you change them? And that's gonna be different for depending on the person. If you are beginning adaptive training for the first time, I'd say once a month or once every four weeks, change up your routines. Because that's about how long it'll take you to get to plateau, to get to, to where your body has adapted to that without having to push even heavier into weights. Um, for those of you who are more seasoned, two to three weeks is fine. But listen to your body. When you feel like you're getting to your about heaviest weights, you don't want to push even further in heavy weights and you want to still create adaptation. If the, if the reps start getting easy to do eight to 10 reps, it's time to change it up a little bit. So that's what I do. And look, these are just my suggestions. Though I know they work for me. Find out what works for you. Some, some may push harder, some may adapt quicker. So your body is different and unique to you. So try that different. So another rep speed is called pump sets. Pump sets are very fast reps. I like doing pump sets after some heavy training. So sometimes uh, you can do what's called pyramid sets. So you start out at a low weight, and then you go a little bit more, add a little bit more, add a little bit more, add a little bit more to your top weight and lower reps, three to four reps at the top, and then six to eight reps, 10 to 12 reps, and then a pump set of 20 reps. So it's called a pyramid because you're going up and then coming back down. Now, what that does is stress the muscle on the strength side, remember hyperplasia strength. So you're recruiting new muscle cells at that point and then coming down and ending with high volume sets like a 20 rep pump. Now that's gorging muscle, uh, blood and, and nutrients into the muscle. When you do those pump sets at the end of your set, you're like forcing extra blood into the muscle tissue. This allows for the waste products in the muscle that you've just created to get out of the muscle and all the nutrients, oxygen, blood flow, water, glycogen, all to get into the muscle. You're forcing basically more blood into the muscle. Gets you an amazing pump, makes you feel fantastic, but also great for health overall too. It increases vascularization, increases, uh, can help with uh, blood pressure to normalize blood pressure. All good across the board fitness wise. All right, well, let's jump into sets, different styles of sets. That was just training with the different reps. You can use negatives in your rep. Negative is the part where you're lowering it. They are called the eccentric versus concentric. Concentric is contracting the muscle. Eccentric is elongating the muscle. If you do negatives, you focus on negatives, sometimes it's easier to use with the machine because uh, you can have somebody else pull it or, or with a, a, a training partner because uh, you can have somebody actually lift like the bench press and then lower it very slowly. That's the negative movement. And this is the positive movement. So if you have somebody lift the weight up for you and then you slowly 
do it down. This will actually help strengthen and elongate the muscle. Now this is good because you don't want the muscle to get too tight and too contracted. That's where injuries can happen, where muscle cramps can happen. So by strengthening it as it's elongating, as you're doing the um, eccentric movement, the negative part of the movement, you can strengthen that. When you combine occasional negative training with your typical positive training or contraction training, you're going to feel a lot stronger. Trust me, you'll heal faster because you are, most people focus only on the positives, right? They pull up and then they almost just like drop the weight right? So there's no effort. There's no strength there. You can do this even just by doing super slow. So, uh, three count up, three count down. You're doing incorporating eccentric and concentric training. This will really help strengthen the muscle, strengthen the tendons and the fibers that support the muscle a lot better uh, than you would in just typical pulling it up and then letting it drop almost by itself, letting the gravity do the work for you. Um, okay, let's jump into the sets. So one of my favorite sets is volume training. Um, and so some of you may need to work up to this, but I do what's called 10 by 10s. So 10 sets of 10 reps for a single exercise. Ow, what this does is really overload the muscle. So one, you need to start with lighter weight. Two, you need to definitely warm up and you can gradually within those 10 sets uh, add a little bit of muscle as your body begins to warm up to it. And then three, be careful. You can push yourself too much in this. So, you know, do try just a couple of, uh, of exercises this way. It's going to make you a lot sore. <laughs> All right, you're going to get more delayed onset muscle when you do volume training, um, sometimes called German volume training, because a lot of the German athletes were doing this type of training and getting fantastic results in the bodybuilding stages. Um, but anybody can do this. Just start with a lower weight, because by the time you get to that hundredth rep, that's right, 110 times 10 sets, it's going to take a while. So one, I would only do this when if you are doing body part training, which is focusing on one uh, body part like chest and tries or back and thighs, uh, or even just back, something like that. Because of the volume amount of it, you're only going to do one exercise uh, per area muscle group, like one for traps, one for shoulders, one for uh, rhomboids, one for lats, and that's it. And then you move on. So you want, because of this type of volume, you may need a little more rest. Uh, two, you may uh, need to up your carbs because you're actually going to burn a lot more energy. So you may need to adjust your diet, your sleep, um, because you may need actually more rest too as well. Uh, another is supersets. Supersets within the set training is actually you can do two or actually more exercise back to back. Uh, a, a very common superset is push-pull. So you can do um, chest and and um, and buys. So it's a push and a pull movement, or buys and tries. So you're hitting the front part of your muscle uh, arm and then the back part of your arm, and you're switching back and forth. And that way, you're actually sending more cell signaling for growth to your body by overloading two different muscle groups at the same time. Now, if you're female or if you are much newer to this, uh, less farther along in your exercise routines um, or just starting out, a great way to do this is what's called whole body training, where you actually hit every single body part at the same time every time you train, giving your body every other day to rest. Um, if you're really looking to burn fat, this is the best way. Uh, full body training can be spectacular for getting weight off because what you're doing is you're engaging the body to say, I'm burning up calories here, I'm burning up calories here, I'm burning up calories here, I'm burning up calories here. You're creating a whole lot more calorie load than you are ISO training, which is just training chest and tries or back and buys. Some lot smaller muscle groups, a lot less energy. Now, if you're focused on building muscle for specific reasons, then isolations 
uh, can be very effective for that too as well. And using less of your energy, say if you're pretty lean to begin with and you have a hard gain or trying to uh, trouble consuming enough calories to gain muscle, then iso, uh, isolations can be a preferable way for you. But if you're looking to burn fat, if you're not looking to burn, uh, add a lot of muscle, but just want to get healthier and fitter and uh, overall in better condition, then whole body training can be a great way it will burn up so much more calories than isolations will will ever do. Um, and then there's a, a, a form of that, which is called upper body, lower body. So you're training all the upper body parts. And then on the next day, you're training the lower body parts. And then you're giving yourself a break on the third day. Again, this is a little bit more for uh, maybe for people who are starting out or people who are a goal just to kind of drop overall body weight and get more in. Uh, overall better physical condition. But even some of the top athletes use this type of training too. So it can be for anyone. Um, so why change it up? <clears throat> All right. And this is where we get into a little bit of the science. So the muscle adapts to the stress. Now, how does it do that? So inside the muscle cell, you have these structures called heat shock proteins. I actually wrote a book on it. Let's see where I have it somewhere. <laughs> All right. It's a, a book on heat shock proteins. Heat, heat shock proteins are intracellular structures that actually uh, tell the body how to, what to build, how to build it and stuff like that. So testosterone comes into the cell and it is picked up by a heat shock protein. It is delivered to the DNA. The DNA splits and becomes messenger RNA, uh, peels off and creates the testosterone says, hey, let's build us a protein. So then it, uh, the, body, the body peels this off, replicates a new protein, generates that protein. And now it's this big long strand of protein, right? That doesn't do anything. <laughs> so you've got the testosterone increase. You've got the protein coming into the cell. You've got the branch chains, the essential amino acids, everything it needs to make that. You've created the protein. That's only half of <laughs> building muscle. And, and that's funny because most people think oh, protein and, and, and testosterone, and that's it. That's all you need. No, that's only half of the equation of building muscle. It's amazing. Physiologically, the whole back half of that is done by heat shock proteins. And how many of people have heard about heat shock protein? Everybody's heard about testosterone. Everybody knows about protein building muscle. No one knows that actually takes that protein and folds it into the perfect shape and then applies it to the actual tissue that is in need when and where it needs it. Even that heat shock protein says, hey, I'm building more muscle hypertrophy, remember? I'm, so the, the cell is getting bigger and stronger. But wait a minute, this cell just can't handle the stress. I need to recruit some more cells. Guess who does that? Heat shock proteins. Heat shock proteins cause the, 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 um, the signaling that tells those progenitor cells to come over and add to that so that they can build even more muscle tissue through hyperplasia or recruitment of nascent baby muscle cells. So heat shock proteins do about good 50 to 60% of the entire job of building muscle and <laughs> nobody talks about them. Oh, well, well you hear it, hear it here first, but how can you, all right, so if these are so important and we all know, oh, you gotta boost testosterone, you gotta uh, add protein. Well, that's just the building blocks and the, 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 the gut foreman that comes in and says, Okay, build me this. <laughs> well, they they do build the the, the protein strand, but uh, you know, forming that protein strand, each little fold in that protein strand dictates what that protein strand can do, will do, and how it functions in the body. So without that folding, your body can be producing protein strands all the time and just getting wasted, just getting broken down and tossed out of the body. If they're not applied to the right place folded in the right way, they don't become what's called functional proteins. So, or the building blocks of real muscle tissue. All right, so these, how can we upregulate or increase the amount of these heat shock proteins doing all the work of the muscle building itself? Well, that's a really cool one. You do need protein because heat shock proteins are from made of protein. They're called functional proteins. So, there are three different types of 
proteins. The protein that you eat or dietary proteins, we break those down into amino acids, bring them into the body. And then there are the proteins that actually do the work, these heat shock proteins in our cells, they're called functional proteins. They carry out work in the cell. And then there is structural proteins. That's the actual muscle tissue itself. So there's three different types, the kind you eat, the kind that do the work of building the muscle, and then the actual muscle itself or the structure, the building materials of the house, so to speak. So you want more workers. You know, you can have all the building materials you want. You can have all the foreman you want, which is testosterone. He just directs what, what type of protein to make, you know. But what you really want is the workers. Without the workers, the house don't get built. Sorry, that's all there is to it. They're probably the most important piece of the whole muscle building process. So how do we upregulate? Well, exercise alone upregulates heat shock proteins, but it's a slower process, up to about two hours. But what if we could upregulate the heat shock proteins prior to the workout they'd be able to do the work a lot faster. They'd be able to repair the muscle a lot faster. They'd be able to strengthen and build the muscle a lot faster and a lot more completely. So how do you do that? Plants. <laughs> Remember, animal proteins do not supply adaptogenic properties. Remember, the muscle itself changing is an adaptation to stress. So plants contain what called adaptogens. So there are adaptogenic herbs. It's a class of herbs. There are several, there's lots of different herbs. Uh, ashwagandha, it's the king of adaptogens. It's considered the top adaptogen in the world. But there are other adaptogens, rhodiola, schizandra, um, so many different, there are different mushrooms that are, have adaptogenic qualities to them. So, consuming more of these can upregulate our body's production of these heat shock proteins inside the cells, which then allows you to have more workers to build the muscle. Very cool. And they only are in plants. So plants, once again, to the rescue for helping us become our strongest, our biggest, and our most physically fit and functional. Um, so these adaptogens, well, I definitely put the king of adaptogens in cell block 80. So it's not only boosting your testosterone, it's helping upregulate those heat shock proteins. So you're not just bringing more foreman to the game to do the direction. How many, how many bosses do you need <laughs> in a cell? You need one, really. Uh, how many workers do you need in a cell? Lots. So it's not just about the testosterone, it's actually upregulating the heat shock proteins through adaptogens. And we use the top, the most studied adaptogen, KSM uh, 66, the most studied adaptogenic, increasing testosterone, increasing muscle size, increasing strength gains, all clinically pr proven and published human studies. That's why I put this in the product because it's so important not only just to try to boost testosterone, that's not the whole game. You can have high levels of testosterone, and if you do not have the other pieces of the puzzle, the protein for the building blocks, but even more importantly, the upregulation of heat shock proteins, you're not gonna build the same amount of muscle. It's just impossible. You cannot tell uh, six foreman testosterones to go to a cell and build me muscle, and everybody's saying, build it, and there's nobody around to do it, to do the job. How fast do you think that house is gonna get built? Right, exactly. It's not just about testosterone. That is a misunderstanding. Does testosterone increasing testosterone work? Yes. Can your body adapt naturally without having to overload the body and create all kinds of uh, nasty health issues? Yes. You can do it by upregulating the heat shock proteins, which can take this workload off of the rest of the parts of the puzzle. So, that's why we change, use changing up. Changing up the workouts, adding adaptogenic herbs helps the body adapt. And as long as you keep changing the workout, the body has to keep adapting. You keep supporting it with nutrition and the body can keep adapting and you can keep building, keep growing. And that's how I can be in the best shape of my life at 58 still and be on stage and compete with guys half my age and win. 
Yeah, all those awards right there. <laughs> uh, natural bodybuilding champion, natural physique champion, two time. So uh, masters champion, I, uh, you know, it's just amazing what the body can do if you put the right nutrition in it and you exercise the right ways. Look, normally if we were outdoors in the wild, we would be climbing trees sometimes. So that's a different muscle group. That's a different way of stressing the muscle. We'd be, uh, you know, digging in the ground some. That's a different bunch of muscle groups. We'd be doing compound motions. That's a different engaging. Your body would be constantly changing. Why is it that humans think we can go into the gym, do the exact same thing every day, and get better results? It's not how it works. That's not what our body was designed to. It's designed to adapt to multiple different things all the time. And if you change up your workouts, use the proper nutrition and especially incorporating adaptogens into your workouts as well, you're going to get results. And by using this constant change, regular change of it, changing the, the pitch, changing the size, changing the rep count, changing the, uh, uh, the sets, changing the way you stress the muscles, these constant changes will keep the body in adaptive state. And that's how you can be your best physical fitness. Not only that, your body with all that muscle memory now will say, you've stressed it in so many different ways. I'm going to make sure I can handle all of them all the time. And I'm going to keep it that way. So what happens? Like I had to take a break for injury or even for the pandemic. For many of you who have taken a break from, from working out for the pandemic. In less than two weeks, I, I've gained like eight, nine, 10 pounds. And that's muscle. And, and look, normal people, this is not going to be the case for most people. What I am saying is this is the case for me because I have been training in this way for so long my body can jump right back into that same physique very quickly, just 10 days. And I'm like eight pounds heavier in muscle. My size different, my shirts fit differently in seven to 10 days. Now, again, that's because I've been training for 30 years on this and I've been training using this system of adaptive training so that my body is, is prepared for every single thing that I can throw at it. And it's prepared to make those changes rapidly because it knows I constantly change. So it constantly has to keep changing rapidly. If you're doing the exact same thing over and over, the body says, we're good. I know that thing already. You're just doing the same thing. I don't need to change. That's how adaptive training can get you to where it is. Now, some of the tips, uh, considerations and suggestions I want to leave you with. When you take on this, take it easy. <laughs> because you're going to feel more sore more often than you've ever felt in your life if you're not already using adaptive training. Uh, because you're ch uh, changing the way you're working out, you're gonna get new levels of soreness, DOMS, delayed onset muscle soreness. You're gonna get serious DOMS, especially leg training in this style, of, um, and especially when you, you get into volume training, you're gonna get some real soreness. So get some extra rest, make sure your nutrition is on point because your body is going to need more recovery. You may have to up your carbs. You're definitely probably going to up your protein because you're actually telling your body it needs to build muscle in more ways. So you're going to actually need more of the built-in blocks. So once you get into your peak physical condition, then you can go into maintenance mode with your protein, but you may need to up, up regular, uh, uh, increase both your caloric, um, intake because you're burning more, utilizing more energy and calories to get there, but you're also going to be needing more building blocks. So this is a different type of training. If you've heard, oh, you only need X amount of protein for regular training, oh, that's regular training. <laughs> when you're doing adaptive training, you got to feed the body. Otherwise, it's going to start breaking down. So remember to adjust your diet accordingly. Also adjust your rest. You may need more rest days in between these. Now, one way you can get around that is by doing isolations. So if you're getting into these uh, constant changes or adaptive training, what you can do is focus on one body part a week so that you're actually giving like four or five days rest for it. So you're, you're stressing it a different way. You're creating a lot more DOMS, three to four days sometimes of DOMS, delayed on, uh, onset muscle soreness. So give your body a little bit more rest period to get into full recovery. When you do that full recovery, the body will come back stronger. Trust me, your strength gains will go through the roof 
I love this part about it. Just in a couple of days of training, uh, back in the gym, getting back in the gym after uh, long delays, months of delays and pandemic, I was using bands just to keep the strength training going and keep the, the muscle engaged. But man, just within three or four days, my body was picking up strength just like super rapidly, which is amazing. But remember, if you're getting back in the gym, take it easy, take it slow, know your body, know its strengths, and let your body adapt. Remember, tendons take longer to adapt. Um, uh, you are going to need, um, it's going to be less boring. Get out of the routine or the rut, sometimes people feel. And I think if you get out of this, you're going to be excited. It's like, wow, what am I going to do train this time? Oh, I'm changing to volume sets. Or this time I'm going to heavy with uh, short reps. It's like, oh, that's good. I can feel the strength. I can feel the power. You can train for power. You can train for force uh, training. You can train for super slows. Boy, that you'll feel some delayed onset muscle soreness like you've never felt before in your life when you train super slows. Even supersets, you're going to burn energy. You're going to drop. You're going to say, oh my God, I need to I need to add more calories to my protein shake. And, you know, put two, three bananas in there or whatever. Uh, add some peanut butter. Get your caloric levels. Get some fats in there so your calories are up. Now, of course, it's going to depend on every different person. Monitor your body. Look at it in the mirror on a weekly basis. Not the scale. Because remember, scale weight, uh, muscle weighs more than fat. So don't forget about the scale uh, unless you want to step on it just for gauging where you're at. But more importantly, how do you look? Are you looking leaner? Are you feeling leaner? Are you feeling more energetic? And then monitor your uh, nutritional intake for that. So in adaptive training, you're going to have less energy. You're going to strengthen smaller supporting muscle groups. Um, you'll get more strength and size gains without having to go heavy and wear and tear on your joints. It's great for both men and women. They're longer lasting gains and you get faster recovery both short term and long term. So um, that's great when you have some downtime, like you're traveling or you have to do stuff for work or something and it interrupts your, your um, workouts, then you can get back in if you train with the three principles that I talked to you about, which is train with intensity, train consistently and train with nutrient density. That's why I picked the most nutrient dense plants in the world in clean green protein to make sure our bodies are getting the most nutritional impact to support all of this change, especially if you're uh, using adaptive training. I hope you enjoyed this one. I hope you had some good takeaways in this one. I'm going to pick up a, a, a couple of these questions from Raymond. Uh, thanks, Raymond, for your questions. Um, do you think uh, blood flow restriction weight training, especially with respect to sarcopenia? He's 79 years old and getting weaker. Um, okay, this is, a, this is a tough one because there's good science on it, but it's with... Um, most of the research that I've read is are, are with very well trained athletes and under strict supervision. Um, there are risks with this type of training. Uh, there are advantages. Basically, the science has said so that there is training uh, doing that. I don't like those personal risks uh, that are associated with it uh, personally, and I would never use them. Um, Yes, they can help with strength, but there's some drawbacks too. When you're restricting blood flow to the muscle, the muscle actually is trying to increase blood flow. So what you're doing is adding an additional stress. If you use adaptive training, you are adding that additional stress without restricting blood flow because the body needs that blood flow both to get nutrients and oxygen to the muscle and it needs it to get um, the waste materials out of the muscle. So I think there's a better way to do that which is adaptive training instead of using uh, blood flow restriction. Now, for those of you using it, I'm not naysaying it. I just personally wouldn't incorporate it um, because there's, well, I'll just leave it alone. I'll leave it at that. Um, so what do you think about adding a collagen supplement for tendon, et cetera, repair? Okay, so let's talk about collagen. Our body produces its own collagen just like every animal does. Uh, do you see any animals out, uh, vegetarian animals like a cow, a cow's a chicken? You know, they're not eating collagen, <laughs> yet they're producing collagen. That's the collagen we're, we're eating, bovine collagen or chicken collagen, type 2 chicken collagen. 
So where are they getting it? Well, their body makes it just like ours. I, I think the collagen thing is it's actually pretty silly. Um, there, if you want, if you're concerned about collagen, probably the the most effective nutrient out there is vitamin C. If you boost up your vitamin C, you will actually stimulate collagen generation. Um, you read the research. Just type in vitamin C and collagen. As long as you're getting a, enough essential amino acids, which is the basis. Remember, collagen is an incomplete protein that's completely missing tryptophan, one of the essential amino acids. So it's not even good to take, it won't build muscle. Collagen builds zero muscle. You cannot build muscle on collagen. Um, so, uh, you know, that's, it's, it's, it's a kind of silly thing and our body makes its own collagen. Yes, can we uh, get worse at, at, at producing collagen? But I think it's because of our overall nutrition and our exercise. Um, what we see in the studies uh, of people's reduced collagen is because they're not eating well and they're not exercising well. If you increase the, improve those two, I think the body uh, will uh, re-engage the collagen production and get you back to at least healthy, normal levels. Um, at least that's what most of the research is pointing to. And again, it's vitamin C. And again, where does vitamin C come from? Plants and only plants. You cannot get vitamin C from animals. Uh, you know, it's, it's funny, uh, uh, carnivores, real carnivore animals actually produce their own vitamin C. Human beings do not. Uh, most herbivorous animals do not produce their own vitamin C because we get it from our food intake. So that's that's one of the clear ways that you can see our physiology is different from carnivore animals um, and that we use that vitamin C to stimulate the production of it. Fruits really high, kiwi super high uh, in vitamin C. Um, Definitely there's natural vitamin C um, uh, supplements. Camu Camu is amazingly high in vitamin C. Um, uh, Indian gooseberry um, is um, probably the richest source of vitamin C. You can get it in a supplement form. It's not really available in the United States in its whole food form. Uh, but even just strawberries, you put strawberries, a handful of strawberries in your smoothie with a clean green protein or something like that, you'll be getting over 100% of your entire day's needs for vitamin C uh, just for about a, a half a cup or more of, of strawberries. So real easy to get that. I wouldn't be concerned about it as long as your protein intake and your vitamin C is intake is there. I wouldn't even mess with collagen at all. I think it's a, kind of a silly supplement. Um, so thank you again for joining us. I hope you guys get some good information out of this. Give me your feedback. I'd love to anybody who takes on some adaptive training techniques. Let me hear your feedback. Um, I'd like to hear about your progress. Um, I give these out to you guys because I want to see you get the best results and be the rep best re representatives for a healthier way of life. Um, uh, okay. Uh, I got another question. Can you do adaptive training at home? Um, yeah, adaptive training can be applied to just about anything you do, which is basically just change the way you do it. If you're training at home with bands, for instance, change up the different exercises, change the pitch of your hands, change the position of your arms. If you're doing biceps, do it this way, then do it this way, then do it this way. So you can change up these different ways of doing and get different results from it. If you're doing a band and you're uh, pulling from this way, you can pull to here and that's gonna be maximum stimulation. You can change the body to here and as you're pulling, you're even getting stronger stress from it. So yes, you can apply adaptive training techniques, whether you're doing free weights or bands or, or uh, machines, just change up the machines and then incorporate other different styles of exercise too. Some of the best exercises are what are called compound movements, where like you take a weight and you pull it up and you're using your bicep here, and then you press it and you're using your shoulders and a bit of your back here, and then you bring it down and push it down and you're using a little bit of low back. So you're using multiple muscle groups, it's called a compound exercise. So anytime you can engage compound exercises, you're gonna get even more strength. It's a more natural flow of the way your body works and you're gonna even get bigger results in, in your total exercises. So drop in some compound exercises when and where you can. Some of the, the three big compound exercises are uh, bench press, uh, deadlift, and squats. 
uh, all three of those are engaging many different muscle groups at the same time to get the weights up. Uh, do be careful always with your form. Uh, use a trainer or a spotter and uh, make sure you're using proper weights and allow it, giving your time uh, before you increase weights, giving your time tendons to uh, strengthen, not just your muscles so that you avoid injury. Well, I hope you enjoyed this. Thank you all for the questions. Great questions. And we'll see you next week. Have a great workout.